Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Sherry Horner, your host at healthfitnessbroadcast.com. And today our guest joins us from Denver, Colorado, Mr. Greg Ryan. Welcome back to the show, Greg. Thank you, Sherry. It's always a pleasure to be with you and speaking with you. Thanks. Well, you got so much great information. Uh, Greg is a speaker, author, motivational speaker and author and a life coach and celebrity trainer. And he was with us one year ago. You shared information on how to stick to your and achieve your goals for the new year. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, trainers and your book, Rich Trainer, Poor Trainer. So if you are a trainer, but not just a fitness trainer, if you're in any industry where you uh, are in service, whether you're a massage therapist, nutritionist, um, fitness trainer, uh, if you're in business for yourself, this is the, the video for you to watch. So Again, welcome back to the show, and um, I want to talk about where you're at. You're in Denver, Colorado, but you were born in Michigan, and Greg then went to L.A., and mm -hmm. then to Louisville, Kentucky, my hometown, and then to Denver, Colorado. So you've been around. You've been in the fitness industry for how many years? Going on 31 years. 31 years. Okay, so yeah. you've, uh, you've been through a lot. You've uh, trained a lot of celebrities. And you've learned a lot. So thankfully, you've put everything into a book. And uh, last time when Greg was with us, we talked about uh, your other book, uh, Changing from the Inside Out. Yeah, that, correct. And then, my first so, book. so today we're going to talk about Rich Trainer, Poor Trainer. Uh, I, I read most of your book, and I'm looking forward to having time to go back and read it cover to cover. Um, but you talk about in the book, uh, you cover psychology, leadership people, common sense, marketing, and the gym and fitness director. So you, you cover all that and then some. So um, I have questions about fitness trainer. Well, when we get to the difference between whether you own a gym or you work for yourself, but um, one thing you said in the beginning or toward the beginning was um, you talked about the X factor and the it factor. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on that? Well, I I have learned a lot. Um, I think I've logged 170,000 hours of personal training sessions over my career. Wow. And uh, the one reason, Sherry, I wrote this book was because I wanted trainers to understand the psychology of dealing with clients and the people side of it. Um, you know, the book is almost an inch thick and it has nothing to do with exercise. It has to do with the people side of it. And the X factor is in a lot of businesses that you see people that are successful they just have this ability to connect with people mm -hmm. and in the personal training business it is a chemistry business and uh, we have to have that ability to connect with people and that X factor has uh, a lot to do with why people hire us as trainers they hire us for accountability mm -hmm. they hire us for motivation and knowledge but at the end of the day it's about accountability and what a lot of trainers, I wouldn't say fail to do, but don't understand, is that you have to be willing to walk away from a client in order to tell them the truth. But what a lot of trainers don't do is they will kind of fudge or say something that they really don't know the answer to because they're in fear that they'll lose the check. Mm -hmm. And the X factor is that thing of um, you know, having that ability to read people to know when to hold people accountable and when to encourage them. And I put that in the beginning of the book because I think that's one of the most important parts. Mm -hmm. and you talk about, um, if for a trainer, if you don't know the answer to something, be honest and say, I don't know that, but I'll go research it and get back to you with the proper answer versus trying to make something up and make it sound like you know the answer. Yeah, people, I mean, it's about respect, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I did write that part in the book about the power of no is that just tell the, your clients, you know, Jane, I just don't know that answer, but I do know somebody that does. And I'll get back with you within 24 hours with that answer. And the interesting part about that is people know when you're kind of BSing them. Mm -hmm. they, they really do. And they, you gain more respect by saying, no, I don't know an answer than by giving them some flippant thing. Mm -hmm. Or if they say, oh, well, my – other trainer or my friend's trainer said this and it's different from what you say um, what would your answer be what well, first, would you suggest they say I'm first of all I don't badmouth any other trainers oh yeah 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 
you just you don't disrespect the training industry or that person or whatever you say well uh, let me get let me back this up with science and, and experience and I'll give you documentation on this and then you make your own decision right yeah you, that's you give the clients the option to make their own decision right yeah that's good well I say well this is how I was trained but let me look into your um, what you're saying and come back with you with the information um, so okay people that are in business for themselves as a trainer and of course everybody wants to do that and you've been in the industry for a long time so have I and you've seen all the changes and um, I think it's really cool that um, I mean at one time trainers that kind of trained out of their home were looked at it like oh well <laughs> you're you must have to be there because you probably can't get a job at one of the elite fitness centers <laughs> but now it's like that's I don't want to say all the rave, but that's kind of a smart way to go for a lot of trainers to, if you have your own facility versus working for someone else. Can you talk about the difference, the differences between the two and the benefits? And Well, I mean, that's a decision that the trainer has to make. And I, I write that in the beginning of my book called Sold Out, mm -hmm. is that my father was a farmer. We, we was raised on a farm and we didn't have to answer to anybody. And I made a decision, Sherry. Uh, at the beginning of my career when I was 18 that nobody was going to tell me how much I was worth at the end of the day and I wanted the Oprah Winfrey approach I wanted to control my destiny mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy at times I slept in my car for almost a year one time and that I made a promise to myself that I was going to control my destiny but that took a lot of guts and sometimes you have to start off in a facility but at the end of the day um, I felt better about myself taking that chance of being on my own. Uh, it wasn't the road most traveled, but at the end of the day, um, and what that did also is it forced me, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is it forced me to be proactive on the cutting edge, think differently than most trainers, and then having a common sense approach of where the industry was going. Right. So it forces you to think, and, and, and this is a business. You have to treat it where you are helping people, but at the, for, at the beginning, you have to decide, is this glamour or is this business? Right, right. And knowing uh, what to charge and setting your limit, like I will not go lower than this no matter what because a lot of, well, everybody in the fitness industry is there to help people. We want to make a living at it, right? But you want to help people, and there's always those people who really need you but can't afford you cannot whatsoever afford you. They may think they can in the beginning, but then what do you say about to those trainers that where you have to set that that limit? Because if you, you keep volunteering, you're not going to end up with a, a an income. No, and that's a great that's a great question and I have made so many mistakes. But the little farm boy who went from LA or from Michigan charging $10 an hour to Los Angeles where they were charging $200 an hour was a, was a drastic jump and it had to do with my self-worth. So uh, I learned a principle in life was that if you want to become like a person that's doing something different or better than you, then go mock them, go duplicate what they're doing. So I interviewed a bunch of trainers in LA and I said, what are you doing? And the first thing every one of them said to me was double your price. And the first thing I did was, oh, I can't do that. My self-image was only about a $20 an hour client. And they said, well, it's a perception thing, number one, but it's a self-worth thing. And what was very interesting was this. I doubled my price reluctantly, but I wanted to be like them. And I doubled my income and my business within three weeks. Wow. And then what happened was my customer service equaled the amount of money I was charging. You step up. I stepped up. And then guess what happened? They wanted to pay me more. And then I charged more, and then my customer service went up. And within a year, I was charging $200 an hour because my self-image and my self-worth. But the other thing is I had to also believe that I was worth that and be willing to let go. Be willing to walk away from that check, right? That's right. Negotiations 101 is that he who needs the one the most loses. And I had to have a value system to me. And that was a very great learning lesson uh, of real life experience from a little farm boy to a, a big city. Now, when you went to LA, um, <clears throat> you worked at Kathy Smith's fitness center. Did that help with your confidence? So I'm like speaking to those trainers that 
work for a nice, well-known name brand facility versus the little hole in the wall gym down the road. Did that help with your confidence and, and getting you to the next level of like, yeah, I'm, I do know what I'm talking about. I can charge more. Uh, no, it, it really didn't because at the end of the day, it wasn't a matter of the facility. The equipment was the same. Mm -hmm. The name on the gym was not Kathy Smith. Um, the, the, the people that came in had the same needs that somebody has in a <clears throat> place in Louisville, Kentucky or, or Evansville, Indiana or wherever that is. So, no, it really didn't. I had to come to the decision that I had something to offer of value and there was an exchange. But that went back to the first thing I wrote in this book of being sold out and treating it like a business. And that is what helped every, the foundation of everything else. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, good. And that's an individual thing. Right. So um, you also talk, talk in the book about um, interviewing a trainer. And uh, <laughs> the last thing you said to him was tucking your shirt. So let's talk about um, perception and professionalism. And, um, you know, when do you not, I, I call it um, just came from the gym look. Uh, because when I'm in meetings and things and, and people may have seen me in gym clothes and then when I show up in a meeting in a suit and they're going, and I'm like, yeah, I know I, I dropped the, just came from the gym look and, uh, uh, it always brings a great laugh. But so what do you suggest for trainers along those lines of professionalism and perception? Well, you know, it does. It goes back to perception. That's the world we live in. And I noticed when I made that decision of having a business, I noticed my persona changed, my confidence level changed. I had a logo on my shirt. I had a name on my shirt. I had a brand. And um, there's a subconscious uh, connection that, that people make. And, and the unfortunate thing in this business is that we get lumped in to everybody. And if there's a bad apple, we kind of get lumped into that at certain times, mm -hmm. no matter what our resume says. And so I've learned over the years that being sold out to what you do in life and in this in this business in particular translates into what you wear, how you speak, telling people uh, in love that I uh, you know you need to get yourself together here and accountability whatever that is, and I told that story because I charge a lot of money for my consulting, and uh, I want people to get the most out of it, and a lot of times trainers don't understand that portion of it. And so, yes, we have our uniforms and we have our uh, workout gear and stuff like that. And that's okay to wear. But be professional because that will translate into income. So this gentleman comes in and we speak for an hour and a half and talking to everything. And I said, okay, well, we're finished. And he goes, well, you didn't really say much. Well, he wasn't at that level of hearing it. Right. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. Tuck your shirt in. And he looks at me like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> and I exchanged and I took the $500. And uh, it, he didn't get it. Right. If he didn't, you know, and what I was trying to get across was treat it like a business. Now, you don't have to have your shirt tucked in all the time. We, we wear workout outfits. Right. It was the principle behind that. Exactly. And what happens there is that if you treat it like a business, your income will double. It, it just goes hand in hand. Right. Because of the confidence level. Yeah, so. and can I add some? You're the man with all the information today, but can I add something? I always suggest don't go to a, uh, if you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, don't show up in your, your warm up suit or your gym polo shirt with the logo. Put on a, a suit. <laughs> Put on a suit. You're dealing with a lot of professional business people there, and you don't want to look like the gym rat. So, anyway, that's my little tip for today. <laughs> um, hey. So, uh, yeah, you um, were a bodybuilder early on in your career, um, and a lot of trainers are also bodybuilders. So, and, and that's hard because you have to really put a lot of emphasis on yourself to get to that level personally, but how would you, um, what would you suggest for those trainers to how they can always put the customer first? Because I talk to a lot of women that know bodybuilders that are trainers and they're just like, 
you know, he's all about him and not about me. So what kind of advice can you give them? Well, this is a people business and it's not about you. I, 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 and a lot of people don't want to hear this, but this business is not about the trainer. This business is about giving people hope through a vehicle of exercise. So it's not about the tight shirts. It's not about how much, how many abs you have. And I did a study. This is really interesting. I did a study in LA about my body fat percentage. The lower my body fat percentage, the higher my income went up. Not how big my biceps were, but it was about my confidence level that had to do with my health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an old saying that says, let your actions speak so loudly that when you do speak, they do not hear you. And my retention span was what governed my success. Not how many clients I had, how long could I keep the little ones, I, the little amount I had. And when it comes to a bodybuilder, you know, you got that perception thing. So you wear looser fit clothing. You tuck your shirt in and be professional or what, you know, what have you. But you also take the, Take it off of yourself. This is not about you. This is not about texting while you're doing a workout with a client. This is not about checking your email and, and, and you know or treating people like a number. And it, it isn't about you. It's it's about that other person. They're coming to you for advice. And bodybuilding has that perception. And pride probably costs more trainers more money than anything in the world. Yep, I believe that. I believe that. I have two more questions for you. Um, one. If we could talk about social media, of course, a lot of people succeed in promoting their business through social media. Uh, I've talked to a few that just say, you know, I tried it for a year and I just never got anywhere. And, and I don't believe in social media as far as promoting business. What are your um, advice and, and take on that? Well, I think it's part of the game at this point. I, you know, I have a brand. It's about branding. And I use social media, I use Facebook, I use LinkedIn, I use a lot of things. I don't use it for getting clients. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about this another time or sometime in here is that I, I think the trainers have totally missed the boat on the market share and, what, and who they're going to get their, their clients from. Um, I call them gatekeepers in the book. And those gatekeepers don't come from social media. Those gatekeepers and what are the people that send you all the clients are the ones that's right around where you live. So social media for me is more of a branding. It's more of a following. I want to create a following of people that look to Greg Ryan Fitness Global. Incidentally, I'm in six different countries now, and I use social media as an educational tool every day of following. Providing content, free content. Providing content and, and knowledge. And that's where the books come in, and then all of a sudden the back end for the speaking and all that. So I don't use social media very much as getting clients. Now, Having said that, online training is becoming more popular, and that's the trend in the next couple of years. And so you will use um, social media for that angle, uh, and I do a lot of that. But over the years, I've spent so little of advertising money because I have found what I call the gatekeepers that are right around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, uh, best advertisement is word of mouth, and that person-to-person, friend-to-friend is, is where it's at. So yeah. one more question. I want to talk about something that you mentioned in the book. Um, well, you talk a little bit about the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. And I know you're big on visualization, uh, as many successful people like yourself are. Um, can you touch on that for a moment? Well, it kind of goes back to that story I told you about, you know, my pricing. Right. And at the beginning of my career, I, I, I couldn't visualize me being paid $100 an hour for something much I enjoy, <laughs> right. you know, much less and more of something I enjoy doing. But I do believe that our confidence has to do, we, we do get what we, our perception of life. And, um, and a lot of trainers with their, uh, you know, their self-confidence or whatever, they wonder why they can't charge more. And that has to do with how they feel about themselves. We do live in a vibrational, uh, uh, perception life and if you don't believe in yourself then that clients not going to believe in you either and I have done four times in my life Sherry I have done creative uh, dream job descriptions on a piece of paper and every single one of those times 80 to 90 percent of that stuff came true within a year and a half mm -hmm. it, was, 
it's just amazing how that works. And if you write down creatively what you want to do in life and what your dream job is with no logic or reason, it's been so interesting. My career started on a Starbucks piece of uh, napkin that said, if I could only exercise with people and get paid $20 an hour for it only in America. That's how my and that's in your book, started. right? Something similar to that is in your book, yeah. 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 And that's how my whole career started. Six months later, I go out on a vacation to California. I end up moving out there. Next thing I know, I went, oh my gosh, I wrote that on a piece of paper a year ago. And now I'm making $200 an hour versus 20 that I wrote on that paper. Right. Write that vision down. Write that you got to write down. that vision down. And, and not limit. You, you talked about limiting um, beliefs. A lot of people believe that if they're in an area that's not um, prosperous, economically they're like well i can only make so much i can you know i'm in this this poor part of town and i'm never going to get clients outside this area or but you mentioned online um coaching and training and there's so many more things you can do uh, with social media and building your own websites and multiple streams of income through those websites so yeah um, i make more money in louisville kentucky than i made almost in every part of the country i moved to yeah now, why would you think Louisville, Kentucky, that you and I were from, and we spent some years there, that, I, that you could do it there? Yeah, yeah, I, I love Louisville. It's a big corporate uh, city, and um, you know, I tell you real quick. I don't know if I ever mentioned this before, but um, I'm in New Jersey now for 25 years, and I would tell people, yeah, I'm from. They'll say, "Where are you from? You have an accent." I'm from Kentucky, and then they would, and I use this in in my speaking engagements because it does make people laugh. They as soon as I say, yeah, I'm from Kentucky, they look at my feet and I'm like, I, yes, I have shoes. So, so about five years ago, I said, okay, I need to change this. So then I say I'm from Louisville and they go, oh, yeah. So they stop looking at my feet. But anyway, uh, yeah, Louisville is a great place. And um, yeah, there's no place like home. But it's time for us to go. Before we go, now I want to ask you, this is a part of the show that I call show share your shoe because I believe shoes tell a lot about people. Now, do you have a favorite shoe and can you tell us why it's your favorite shoe? My favorite shoe? Yeah. For a guy, I do have a lot of shoes. And you Kyle, have one on your I'll, foot? Uh, no, I, I, see, that's the beautiful part about what I do is I, this is my painting studio. This is my creative writing studio. I'm overlooking the mountains and uh, I have no shoes on. Beautiful. I got my, the fireplace my... going. I, you know, my own little place. And so I don't, favorite pair of shoes. I mean, I don't know. It's boots out here. Boots, hiking boots. Hiking, hiking boots. Hiking boots. Um, Sweet. you know, Sweet. everything's outdoors here. Sweet. Yeah. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, well, I do have a shoe, a show. I have a different shoe for the day. And my shoe for today is a Nike running shoe. Uh, it's beautiful color I've had for years and I've put many, many miles on it, but I can't get rid of it. Love the Nike shocks. Love Nike Shock. So I want to thank you again so much for all your information. Uh, I will have a link below for his uh, website where you can find his book. Yeah. And um, it's book. Uh, you sell the hard copy and the downloadable. Thanks for sending that to me. Uh, I want a hard copy. I love hard copy books. Uh, I do read some uh, downloadables, but um, I love to have the book at the beach. Talking about scenery. That's my place. Let's go to the beach. Read, read, read. And then... Um, Hold that book. I know it's funny. I have to read the book, close my eyes, ponder what I just read, read some more. Love it. And with uh, a computer, it's hard to do that. <laughs> so anyway. Next, next time we talk, let's uh, let's talk about I'm coming out with another book that's talking about where the trend is going with the uh, aging market. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. Definitely like want to cover that. Yeah, and the next time I'm out in that way, um, stop in and we'll do an um, interview like this person to person, not split screen. Okay? Sound good? All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Take care. Thanks for watching, everyone. Share this video if you like this information. And uh, appreciate you uh, watching and subscribing.